Okay, so for this new topic, interrupts and exceptions, we're going to start out a little bit wordy and read to you from the manual, and then we'll, you know, reiterate throughout the rest of this section exactly what the manual is trying to say. So, interrupts and exceptions are events that indicate a condition exists somewhere in the system, the processor, or within the executing program or task that requires the attention of the processor. When an interrupt is received and an exception is detected, the currently running procedure or task is suspended while the processor executes an interrupt or exception handler. When the execution of the handler is complete, the procedure resumes execution of the interrupted procedure or task, and the processor receives interrupts from two sources, external hardware-generated interrupts and software-generated interrupts. Okay, so what is this saying? We've got interrupts and we've got exceptions, and what it's saying is for both of them, they both have to do with when something just happened on the system and it needs to halt whatever it's doing and go off and handle whatever happened. So I kind of break it up like this. So we've got an event indicating a condition exists somewhere in the system that requires the attention of the processor. And there's two types. There's interrupts and there's exceptions. And of the interrupts, there are hardware interrupts. And then there's going to be software interrupts that occur because of assembly instructions, for instance. Then of the exceptions, there's three types. There's faults, there's traps, and there's aborts. And we'll talk about each of those in a little bit. So what is the difference between an interrupt and exception if they're both conditions that require interrupting whatever you're doing and jumping off somewhere and handling it? Well, generally speaking, exceptions typically indicate some sort of error condition, whereas interrupts are more often than not caused by external hardware saying like, hey, someone pressed a key on a keyboard, please you know, handle this key now. Hey, someone sent a packet to the network card, please handle this packet now. So you can sort of think E for exceptions, E for errors. Exceptions are typically error conditions that need to be handled and interrupts are different things. Also, we'll learn later about a thing called the interrupt flag and interrupts clear the interrupt flag so that you don't have recursive interrupts happening, interrupting, interrupting, interrupting each other, but uh, exceptions don't. But we'll cover interrupt flag in a little bit later. So of these three categories of exceptions, they're sort of unmemorable, and hopefully I'll provide you a thing to make it a little bit more memorable here in a second. But the categories were faults, traps, and aborts. The fault was a recoverable type of exception, and it's recoverable because the RIP which points at the specific instruction that caused the exception is going to be pushed onto the stack. So basically it's saying, you know, this thing right here is where a problem occurred, go handle it, and then you can come back later and return execution flow there if appropriate. A trap on the other hand is also recoverable, but the difference is that whereas a fault pointed the RIP at the assembly instruction that caused the exception, a fault points the RIP at the assembly instruction after the instruction. So basically fault is like saying this thing right here caused the problem and trap is saying, yeah, a problem just occurred, but I had to continue this assembly instruction and I moved on but you know, just so you know, now here the, the RIP is pointing at the next assembly instruction. And the third category, a abort, is unrecoverable, and it may or may not uh, actually save the RIP. It depends on the particular type of error that occurred. So to help you try to remember this, we're gonna go with these mnemonic devices. A fault RIP points at the faulting instruction, just like Simpsons Hitler here pointing at Bobo saying, this is all your fault. But it wasn't Bobo's fault, it was Hitler's fault. So RIP points at the faulting assembly instruction. Fault, Hitler, Hitler's fault, it was Hitler's fault, and RIP points at the faulting assembly instruction. It's a trap! So RIP for a trap points at the assembly instruction after the trapping instruction. So something happened, and after the fact, they tell you it's a trap. But it's too late, it's a trap, and the trap has already been sprung. Finally, aborts. RIP may or may not be recoverable. Abort, abort, because there's nothing you can do about it. So back to the categories. Something indicating something happened that needs the processor's attention, interrupts from hardware and assembly instructions, which we'll see more later, exceptions, fault, Hitler's fault, points at the assembly instruction that is faulting, trap, it's a trap, it's too late, the assembly instruction has already occurred, RIP points at the next assembly instruction, and abort, abort, there's nothing you can do about it. The ship is going down. So 
what happens when these sort of things, interrupts and exceptions occur, is that the processor needs to save some state so that it can say like, we're running, we're running, we're running, stop, jump off somewhere else and come back later on if we can actually recover from it. And so, you know, how is it going to do this? Well, the hardware saves very little state, just enough to resume execution of whatever was occurring. And then it's actually the, re the responsibility of a exception handler or a interrupt handler in order to save any additional state it needs in order to get back to the running state of the system before the exception or interrupt occurred. So just to show you a little bit of the, how it used to work on 32-bit systems, just to contrast with 64-bit, Previously, when you had no privilege level change, so there could be exceptions and aborts where maybe there would be a privilege level change. Specifically, uh, it was interrupts is the most common case where you're going to have a privilege level change. Typically, something might be occurring. You might be running in you know, user space and then an interrupt occurs because you got a network packet and it's going to transition into the kernel because the kernel is going to be the one responsible for handling you know, a kernel driver that talks to a network uh, piece of hardware. So there's the no privilege change version and there's a privilege change version. When there was no privilege change, previously uh, they wouldn't actually save the stack pointer or the stack segment register. They would just save the eFlags, CS, EIP, and error code if appropriate. Not everything has an error code, some do, some don't. And then with a privilege level change, so when they were going, for instance, from ring three to ring zero, they would save off the stack pointer as well. So the SS, the ESP, eFlag CS, EIP, and error code if appropriate. So now on 64-bit systems, it's no longer conditional about whether or not you have a privilege level change. They just always save the SS and the RSP, the R flags, the CS, the RIP, and an error code if the particular thing takes an error code. And so this picture was just showing you know, the, the difference, assuming a privilege level change Back in the day, you know, four byte registers and now eight byte registers. So this is what you would expect to see after some sort of interrupt or exception occur. The stack would have an error code if appropriate, RIP, CS, R flags, etc. So you've seen push pop, the balanced, uh, perfectly balanced set of assembly instructions for pushing things onto the stack, popping them off. You've seen call ret. Call was the thing that redirected control flow somewhere else and then ret popped to the return address off the stack and went back. And so now, here you go, int and iret. Perfectly balanced as all things should be. So an interrupt would occur and the stack pointer would be you know, pointing somewhere in order to save information. And a consequence of an interrupt or an exception occurring is that the hardware will actually sort of push this information onto the stack. And so after the interrupt or exception, this is what the stack is going to look like. But then the iret, interrupt to return assembly instruction, is what's going to be used for a interrupt handler to get back out of that interrupt and to pop this information back off the stack to effectively resume execution where it was pointing when the interrupt occurred. So pops it back off and resumes execution wherever it was.